Hundreds of generations have lived on the lands of Ukraine since the Neolithic period and there was a constant process of exchange of information between them – knowledge, traditions, mythology, language and symbolism. These information markers are crucial to each nation and they make it possible to understand who we are and what is our purpose. For millennia, the information that was passed down from parents to children and grandchildren was supplemented and changed. Who were your grandparents? Do you remember them? Who do we ask in the search for answers? Who lived on this land before us? Who will come tomorrow? What unites us? Is there a connection between us? Step by step, we descend into the past, holding on to the thread that goes through millennia. So I worked there for two or three years by then, and Petro Viktorovich always stayed when we went home. I once asked, what do you do here at night? He replied, there is such a thing as Damascus. I didn't know what it was at that time. I'd heard something of Damascus, but I knew nothing about it. He said, I saw that you also make knives, and I did occasionally ask to come in on days off to make a knife. I'd forge something, cut it, sharpen it, and go home. So he asked, are you interested in this craft? I replied, yes, I am, so maybe you should join me. Since then we started restoring it all. Petro Viktorovich got obsessed with this idea, with the idea of Japan, the idea of Damascus, the idea of Bulat steel. All that was only in documentaries, and he then said, we must do this, we must restore it to the level that it used to be in the past. The name of Damascus still comes from the name of the city where the largest market was in ancient times. This is the city of Damascus in Syria. That's exactly where all merchants started selling these knives. Who made them and how did they make them? At the time, the only thing that mattered was that steel was of high quality and was in high demand there. We also had steel in our territory, but it was of lower quality. The quality there was higher. They actually used to sell both the Damascus and Bulat steel, which were considered the same. Later they started to distinguish the quality of the steel used to make knives. The fact is that Damascus steel was made from several different ores. They were simply combined. No one thought about the engraving at the time. The simple fact is that everyone wanted to make better steel. They selected carbon and low-carbon steel that was smelted into layers in the furnace. Then they took the appropriate number of those layers so that the soft and hard layers were alternated. The soft layers prevented the machine blade from breaking, while the hard layers served as the cutting element of the blade. They say that the techniques used in making Damascus and Bulat steels are a thing of the past, but this technique is being revived today. Steel, how should I put it? It's like potters have different clay in each region and make different bricks. 
The matter is about quality, firing and composition. It's the same with ore. There is one kind of ore in the Poltava Oblast and a different one in the Kyiv Oblast. Then there are marsh ore and they all have different chemical compositions. So we cannot say that Bulat steel has been lost. When Bulat steel was extracted from 200 to 1000 years ago, the chemical composition was analyzed and their composition was different. But there was no chemistry science in those years, so experts could not do this. But today this is possible. People used to mix soft and hard steels to make sabers that would not break. There were experienced master smiths in those times. What do I do and how do I use it? Ore was my biggest problem. I knew that iron oxide was mill scale and swamp ore was buried somewhere there. I had no desire to crawl around a swamp and dig in the mud, looking for I don't know what it was and had no idea how to process it. It was not something that I would engage in. That's why we bought an already concentrated ore that was enriched according to the standards of modern technology. Next is the process itself. I take the ore, let's put it this way, one unit of ore and one unit of ordinary coal. I use the waste and simply grind the coal, which we also burn now. And the end product is ordinary homemade flour. When I mix all of that, I end up with the following concentration. I moisture it a bit by adding water so it won't stick together and remains moist, so that it won't get blown out of the furnace. The use of bellows can blow them out of the furnace. This way, less will be blown out, because then there is more waste. Okay, what do we have here? We already, give me a moment, I'll add some. When the furnace is heated up, I start adding it all. Obviously, I eyeball how much I need to add. Sometimes it takes five minutes, sometimes it takes three. I have just added some, so I need several minutes to show it. I will now tell a bit about how the furnace works. There is nothing new and nothing revolutionary. What people invented a thousand years ago, we call the bloomery. This is exactly what we have here, but it looked different. The bellows, which are fundamental in this case, and charcoal. Next, the choice of what to put in there is up to you. Some choose ore, others choose with mill scale. The formation process is easy to understand already. Iron oxide reacts with carbon dioxide and turns into iron. Now we're going to try and pull out two layers of wrought iron. Then we will check how well the process turned out. I have done this many times, so I am more confident about what is inside. But still, it does not go smoothly every time. So now we take the ore, which is highly concentrated. It is slightly moisturized, so it is not moldable and is not dusty enough to be blown out. The ratio is one unit of ore to two units of coal, one to two. Then the process itself takes place. I 
I pull the wrought iron out. It needs to be forged right away. It is red and ugly like foam rubber and is totally deformed and does not resemble anything that you have seen before. You can determine what it will turn into at the first strike. If done properly, it will be real iron and I forge it into steel. Then it will turn out a nice sharp blade. It is very good material to work with. In any case, it deserves respect because I made it and I would not want to throw it away. But sometimes it sits a year or two on the shelf because I feel that it won't become that product that I wanted. They say Petro was a master of this craft. He'd been mixing these various steels for many years. He understood which ones were compatible and which ones were not. He removed those that were not compatible from the warehouse. So we were left with those components that he combined and achieved a high level of quality. Over half a year that I worked with him, he taught me the basics of making Damascus steel. I will repeat Petro's words. If you won't make a sword, you'll make a saber. If you won't make a saber, you'll make a knife. If you won't make a knife, you'll make an all. You just keep trying to make something, then all will work out. We heat it up to 900 to 1000 degrees. The required temperature depends on the type of steel. We pull it out of the furnace and make strips. Then we cut the strips into pieces of a certain size. Then we polish them and remove the mill scale completely, so it shines like a mirror. We pour some borax on them. Then we combine five sorts of steel. It depends. Sometimes we make 16 layers, sometimes 15, as many as we can fit into the press. Then we put them into the furnace and heat it up to 1200 degrees. We flux it with borax for easier smelting. Back when there was no borax, People smelted shattered glass with sand, so it would melt. They ground the glass and poured it, like we do it with borax now, so it would melt and fill the gaps for better smelting. Then we heat it up to 1200 degrees under a press with an output of 300 atmospheres of pressure, about 30 tons. Molecules fuse together at the temperature of 1200 degrees. Then we put them under the press and throw them into the furnace, where they smelt for 10 to 15 minutes. After those 10 to 15 minutes, the metal becomes monolithic. After that, we press it into the size we need. Then we cut the 14 or 15 layers, put them back together and smelt them. The process of one smelting takes about an hour. Then we smelt it again, pull out the square, cut it and put it back together. Now we have 60 layers. Then we smelt it again, pull it out and we have 120 layers. We repeat the process until we get the required number of layers. We mostly make Damascus steel with roughly 1,000 layers. Another good feature about Damascus steel is that the more layers there are and the thinner they are, the better it cuts. When one layer wears out, another one is exposed and can be used for cutting and so on. Then we pull out the forged strips. Thank you.
We used the strips to forge blades according to the blueprints from the orders. Then they are sanded, and after that we put them back into the furnace for tempering. Only after that we sand everything down to the required dimensions. The last stage is sharpening. We could not believe that we, some village guys, who looked at pictures and videos on the internet in the early morning, went to work, returned home in the evening and saw a photo. Thank God we can see it. Learning from that experience took a lot of hard work and kilograms of wasted metal. But we really wanted to prove to everyone that we could do this here. And it turned out that in the end, we truly managed to achieve our ultimate goal. I will continue to work at Petro Smithy until the end. I will maintain the fire that he lit for as long as I can. I will dedicate my work at the Smithy until my retirement. And if I'm still in good health by that time, I will work at the Smithy with all of my heart and soul.